Crystal Giese is a former member of the of this church uh, in, in, here in Grandview before she moved back to Ohio, where she uh, is from. And, and when she was here, she worked for an organization called L'Arche or L'Arche. I think it's a French word. Does that ring a bell, Shirley? L'Arche or L'Arche? I think it means the ark. I'm not sure about that. Yeah, whatever she whatever she said. Uh, <laughs> I thought it was large, but so that's the way I'll pronounce it because I don't know what you said. But it's a ministry that provides housing and programs for adults with intellectual disabilities. And just to give you a little bit about what they're about from their website, they say we are people with and without intellectual disabilities living, working, praying and playing together in community. And they strive to make known the gifts of people with intellectual disabilities, foster environments that meet our members changing needs and engage in diverse cultures, working toward a more humane society. So that's the organization she was working with. And she would bring with her almost every week two of the men who lived in the house that she worked at, Jeremy Green and Michael Wheelock. You might remember them. They brought them here almost, she brought them here almost every week. And Jeremy would ask about our dog almost every time I talked to him because we had him over the house and he met Maggie. We don't have her anymore, but he would ask about her. And then my beautiful wife, Beth, uh, told me a memory that she had that, that Jeremy, he was blind, uh, when Julia was first born, asked to touch her face to see what she looked like and said, oh, she's beautiful. Michael was quieter, but they both came almost every Sunday with Crystal. And I had the opportunity to go to their house on a number of occasions, as well as participate in their group meetings. And, and at those meetings, I learned a song that they sang with one another. And I want to share it with you. And you probably have heard it before, because when they were here, I, I uh, had to sing it when, when they had a friend come as well. But bear with me. Here's how it goes. This is the song they taught me. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Simple song. If those words sound familiar, it's because they are the prayer of one of the criminals on the cross next to Jesus that we're going to look at today. That was his prayer. Unfortunately, there were others also speaking, and we already looked at the soldiers and the rulers last week, but there was also another criminal. There was one on each side, and the other criminal joined in the other chorus that was being sung, that of mockery, and ridicule. So we have this prayer and we have the mockery and ridicule in our text today. Luke chapter 23 verses 39 through 43. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. This is the word of the Lord. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We're punished justly, for we're getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. The word of the Lord. I'm going to give us some R's, words that begin with the letter R through our text today that mark out the plot of this account. And the first R word, and maybe you're my inspiration here, Wayne, with the, with the alliteration here. The first R word is ridicule. Ridicule. That's what the first criminal does. He ridicules Jesus and he joins in the others in tempting Jesus to save himself. He says the same kinds of things. And he adds, save us, referring to he and the other criminal. Now that, that request, save us, might sound like he has some kind of favorable attitude toward Jesus. But from the other criminal's response to him, and the meaning of the word of hurling insults here, it's clear that this criminal held Jesus of no account. He thought nothing of Jesus. 
The criminal insult, uh, hurls insults. It's the same word for blasphemy, in fact. Uh, word studies tell me that this is contemptuous speech intentionally short of reverence due to God. That's what was happening here with this other criminal. The message captures well the meaning here. Some Messiah you are. Save yourself and save us. That's the idea here. He, he has nothing favorable, no favorable attitude toward Jesus. He was insulting Jesus. And that's awfully brazen for someone who is being crucified for crimes he committed. To say that to Jesus. And that's exactly what the other criminal points out, which brings up our second R word. He rebukes this other criminal. The ridicule and now rebuke. Rebuke is the second R word. And this first criminal, uh, he says, has no basis for what he's saying or to insult anybody. And, and, and he includes himself in that. He says, neither of us do. We are getting what our crimes justly deserve. We're, we're getting what, what, uh, what we deserve. But this man has done nothing. And so he's taking responsibility for the wrong he's committed. And he's pointing out that this other uh, criminal isn't doing that. And so verse 41, if you look there, is something of a confession then, or to add another R word, repentance. In fact, David Neely says, the second criminal evidence is the repentance that the story of Jesus has been about. In this gospel, the path to salvation is through repentance and forgiveness. So not only does this second criminal rebuke the, uh, the other criminal, he in, then in turn is defending Jesus, right? He's, he's saying, but this man has done nothing wrong. He's innocent. Now, now, how he comes to that conclusion is, is uncertain. How does, he, how does he know that? Perhaps he's aware of Jesus' ministry. Uh, perhaps he's heard Jesus' Jesus's prayer for the forgiveness of those who are crucifying him. That we looked at last week or the week before. Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. That's not a prayer of a person who's guilty. Maybe that's what revealed it to him. Uh, perhaps, in fact, that... that uh, that prayer so arrests his attention that it even holds out the possibility that he could receive forgiveness for what he's done. If Jesus could pray that for those crucifying him, maybe he too could receive forgiveness. Perhaps, perhaps even the mockery of the rulers. He saved others. You know, that was said mockingly, but it was true, remember? He saved others. Maybe that gives him hope that Jesus can save him. So this second criminal not only rebukes the first criminal but he also prays the prayers that the prayer that i sung earlier jesus remember me when you come into your kingdom and that's the next r word remember there was ridicule rebuke repentance now remember the word remember i found out means not just to remember like a call to back to mind but for his good to look after, to care for. He's asking Jesus to, to uh, have mercy on him, in other words. But also, notice, it is a remarkable statement of faith, this prayer. By referring to his kingdom, right? Remember me when you come into your kingdom? By referring to his kingdom, this, this criminal is acknowledging that Jesus is the king of the Jews, as the sign above him reads, and that his death does not disqualify or put an end to the kingdom that he's king of. Isn't that amazing? I mean, here he is dying on the cross, and this criminal acknowledges that Jesus is king, and his kingdom will still stand. In fact, another translation puts it, when you come into your glory. So he's already anticipating that this isn't the end for Jesus. That's pretty amazing. When you're hanging there right next to Jesus, that's a pretty amazing and remarkable statement of faith. And Jesus validates that very thing. He validates that very thing. Uh, the, the message puts Isaiah 53, 1, who believes what we have heard and seen? Who would have thought God's saving power would look like this, right? The rulers and the, and the, and the soldiers and the first criminal don't believe that. We looked at that. Uh, and, and now this first criminal is, is, is uh, joining the others. But this, 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 uh, this criminal takes, has a different view. They don't think that's God's saving uh, salvation that could look like the cross. But this, this second criminal in some measure does. Ken Hurst says, Jesus' response certainly reveals that he accepts this criminal's plea and faith 
And did you hear what Jesus says? Today, truly, I tell you, you will be with me in paradise. Jesus saved others throughout his ministry. Remember, we looked at some of those last week. Jesus saved others, and as Messiah, he's still saving others on the cross, even as he hangs on the cross, right? He, and this isn't just an abstract uh, application here in terms of, you know, Jesus is the Savior of the world, right? No, right, right then and there, he saves a criminal who is living his final hours on earth. It brings us to another R word in this account, and it's the one we'll be spending the remainder of our time on, and that is redemption. There's the ridicule of the first criminal. There is the, the rebuke and repentance of the second criminal. There is the, the prayer to remember me from the second criminal. And now there is the redemption of the second criminal. Ray Craddock says three times he's been mocked with save yourself from, from, uh, from all these soldiers, the rulers, and now the criminal, and now this other criminal adds, and us. Here Jesus does save someone, and that the one saved is a dying criminal is totally congenial or, or matches the types of persons Jesus blessed throughout his ministry. Remember, we've gone through some of them, tax collectors like Zacchaeus, uh, sinners of all kinds, depicted especially by the ungrateful prodigal son in Jesus' parable in Luke 15. And that brings us to a tension here in our text that, uh, that, that needs to be brought up. As positively as we might be predisposed to this second criminal, we also might balk at the thought that someone who obviously didn't live a life pleasing to God is going to get into the kingdom last minute. Right? Here's this guy who, who, who lived a life of crime, apparently, or, or, or uh, he admits that, right? We've done what our, we're getting what our deeds deserves, and now, now he's going to get into the kingdom right before he dies? How's that fair? That's why Matthew 20 was read again this morning, and we covered this in September, if you'll remember, but it was read again this morning because it brings up the same issue, right? How is it fair that the, work, the first workers who were hired at the beginning of the day, who worked all day in the heat of the day, are getting paid the same amount, who, who only worked an hour at the end of the day when it was cool of the day and all the major work was already done? How is it fair that they get the same amount of money? And you'll remember from, I hope from, well, maybe you don't, but I, maybe I didn't even remember. But I, I mentioned from in that sermon that this parable isn't about how life isn't always fair. That's not what that parable is about, okay? It's not about teaching us about economics or employee and employer relationships either. It, this isn't a license for any kind of injustice. Jesus says this parable depicts the kingdom of God. So here's what that means. And we're going to apply it to our text today because it brings up the same thing. All right. In the kingdom of God, it isn't about who deserves what or more. That's not a kingdom mindset. That's, uh, that's how things operate in the world, right? You know, I did this, this, and this. Therefore, I deserve this, this, and this. Right? That's how things work in the world. But in the kingdom of God, it isn't about who deserves more or what. Remember one of our working definitions of grace, David Busick says, grace is not about who deserves to be rewarded. It is about undeserving persons who are given gifts anyway. That's what grace is. The kingdom of God is about a generous God then whose giving knows no ending, which, has supreme, which he has supremely demonstrated by giving us Jesus Christ. So the kingdom of God then is a kingdom of grace. So in the same way in our text, the criminal, obviously, yes, it's true, he doesn't deserve paradise with Jesus, but who of us does? Who of us does? None of us do. No matter how many years we've been walking with the Lord, no matter how much good we think we have done and racked up, as if we could point to that as some type of accomplishment. No, no, no. That's not what the kingdom of God is based on. 
To be forever with the Lord is a gift granted by God's grace. So the longer we serve him, and this is the, this is the warning for those of us who have been walking for the Lord for a while. So the longer we serve him, we must guard more and more against thinking that we've done something to merit something from God. Philip Yancey, and I, I gave a book list to the church board that I would be reading during my sabbatical. I've already read two of them. One of them, <laughs> one of them is What's So Amazing About Grace by Philip Yancey. And he, and he writes about this account in that book. He, he says, Jesus, and this relates to what I've just been talking about. Jesus forgave a thief dangling on the cross, knowing full well that that criminal would never attend a Bible study. That he would never go to a synagogue service or a church service. That he would never make right with those whom he had wronged. And those would have all been good things, right? That, 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 would, have been, that would have been something that, that should have happened. But the account points out that grace, that, that, uh, grace does not depend on what we have done for God but rather on what God has done for us. Now, it's true that this account of the criminal doesn't mean that we can or should postpone walking with the Lord, because to do that is to reject Christ's redemption. In fact, I heard somebody recently say that their plan was that they're, they're going to serve the Lord in retirement, that that was their retirement plan. When they got old enough, then they would serve the Lord. Uh, they, they, they gave the, the, the deadline of around 50 years old, he said. But we don't know what tomorrow will bring, right? We can't just hope that we'll make some kind of, or be able to make some kind of deathbed confession. Uh, we're, we're not guaranteed another hour, and we can't manipulate God's mercy and grace that way. But more than that, think about this. That means that we would miss out on the life the criminal had no opportunity to have. To live a life in service to the Lord and for his glory, miss out on that. We would miss out on a daily walk with the Lord, the joy, the trusting, the hope, the guidance, the, the, the help that he gives us. We'd miss out on his will and purposes for our lives. So it's true that it would have been better if this man would have lived for God before he went down this destructive path and before he had to be crucified for his crimes, before he made a confession. It would have been better for that to happen, but he did not do that. And he cannot do that because he's going to die. So all he can do is plead for mercy. All he can do is ask Jesus to remember him. And Jesus gives this criminal the assurance that not only will he be remembered, he is redeemed and will be with him today, that very day, in paradise. In fact, the contemporary English version puts it, I promise you, today you'll be with me in paradise. It's a promise that the criminal was given. That statement from Jesus, along with other passages like Philippians 1.23 and 2 Chronicles, excuse me, 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 10, affirm that when a believer dies, they are ushered into the presence of the Lord. That's part of our hope. That's what's promised to this criminal. He, he won't be saved from physical death, notice, right? He won't be saved from the consequences of his crime there on earth. He's still going to have to die, but he will be saved from his spiritual lostness. Remember, I talked about that comment from David Neely who talked about in, in Luke, the word to save has that double meaning. Yes, physical death, but spiritual lostness especially. And what they're asking Jesus to do is save himself and them from physical death. But Jesus is there to save them from spiritual lostness. And the connection there that he gives to, to Luke 19.10, which is Jesus' mission. He says this is his mission. Today, he says of Zacchaeus, Salvation has come to this house for this man too is a son of Abraham. Why? For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. And that's what Jesus is even doing on the cross. So this isn't just some theory about Jesus and what he'd done. 
This isn't just some kind of theological affirmation. But here it is. Even on the cross, Jesus is saving others. And that was his mission. He came to seek and to save the lost. And here, even as he is dying, he saves a criminal right next to him. That's the heart of our Savior. Yes, that is his love. And this points out again. That Jesus takes upon himself a death and condemnation he didn't deserve so that we could receive what we don't deserve, including redemption, the forgiveness of sins. That's the grace of the cross. So here are our words. <laughs> Ridicule, rebuke, repentance, remember, redemption. And I guess there is one more R word. And that is our response. Our response. For the believer, Jesus' words, I hope you'll embrace these and hold them as a promise. Because it is one for every believer. Jesus says, you will be with me. <laughs> That's a promise to you who know Jesus Christ. He says to you, you will be with me. Ken, you told me several weeks ago that John 14, 1 through 6 is one of your favorite passages because he says, what does Jesus say? I want to take you to be where, where, where I am. You will be with him, he promises. Not just in this passage, but in that passage and other passages. We will be with the Lord. That's a promise for which we can respond in thanksgiving for. And again, the hymn near the cross ties in. I didn't plan this, but... This has just kind of worked out this way, that near the cross has kind of been a, a hymn for this sermon, of series, this sermon series, this part of it at least. Near the cross, here's how it ties in again. I told you that the hymn writer Fanny Crosby was blind from six weeks of age. But I came across another account at the end of her life, or near the end of her life, when D.L. Moody, a famous evangelist, asked her a question near the end of her life. And he, he asked her, if there would be one wish that could be granted to you, what would you ask for? And he assumed that she would ask to see again because she had blind, been blind all of her life, right? He, he assumed that that would be what she would ask for. And she seemed to sense that. So she said to him, I wish, if I could have one wish, I wish I could be blind for the rest of my life. And D.L. Moody was taken aback and said, Why would, how, how can you say that? Why would you ask for that? Listen to her response. Because after being blind for all this time and for all these years, I want the face that I see first to be the face of Jesus. That's the promise given here to the criminal. That's the promise for you and I. We will see Jesus face to face. Do you hear the promise? You will be with me, Jesus says. Oh, that's, that's one of the greatest promises we have, isn't it? We will be with the Lord forever. And you will get to see your Savior's face. The one who died for you. In fact, the third verse of the psalm we're going to sing in response that the musicians would come, especially affirm this, when I stand in glory, I will see his face. Then there are those that we're thinking about today that we, uh, teens, we even prayed for in the, in the, in the uh, Sunday school class. We're thinking about today, uh, you brought up your husband, uh, Jeanette. Those who don't know the Lord. And there's a word here for them as well that will be an encouragement to us and for us. Ken Hurst says there's three crosses that dominated the Jerusalem skyline that day. The man on the center cross died for sin. The man on the left died in his sin. The man on the right died knowing his sin was forgiven. The crosses on either side represent the only two responses that are possible. To accept and be saved or reject and be lost. And for those who have not accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, the forgiveness of sins, all that Jesus died to provide for them, uh, part of our prayer can be that their eyes would be open to see 
their spiritual condition, that they're spiritually lost, that they've gone their own way, and that they would realize that this Jesus that we're talking about all the time is the one who died for them. And that the Holy Spirit would invite them. And maybe there are some here even that would recommit their life to Christ. To respond in repentance. That is to turn to the Lord and turn away from sin. And plead for mercy as the criminal did. In fact, we can pray that, that those who don't know him would even use the words of, could even use the words of this criminal as the beginning of their prayer. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Or as a the tax collector prayed in one of Jesus' parables, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. You can pray that the day of salvation would come and is here and now is the acceptable time as uh, the Lord has been helping us to believe. Let's, uh, let's stand and sing this hymn of response, There is a Redeemer. And for those of you who are believers this morning, may verse 3 especially minister to you. When I see His face, when I stand in glory, I will see his face. Let's sing this together.